the brief of this uh, of this panel um, was fairly broad and uh, were to speak about resistance to fascism in India and Kashmir. In no particular order, I just want to uh, put forward a few points and also react to a few things. Um, so I want to start by saying that human beings are bundles of prejudices, even the best of us. And I think that we, we also have tremendous capacity for violence. And uh, that, that is something that we should sort of take for granted, that we are bundles of prejudice, we have enormous capacities for violence. Now, given all of that being the case, and at this point in history in 2019, the task ahead for any person who wants to see a world that is not totally consumed by pernicious ecologies and uh, pernicious politics is very hard. And, and I want to begin by acknowledging the enormity of what faces us. Um, also, as a, you know, as a person who, uh, who's Kashmiri and feminist and post-structuralist and animist and lots of other things, I feel myself implicated and involved in multiple struggles. So what I will say will be about Kashmir, but will also draw attention to some of these other things that we're talking about. And um, so, um, so I want to just say that, um, that at its broadest, Kashmir was never not colonized. Uh, you know, what is happening now is, a, a diff is an iteration of that process. But what is happening now, and I do not mean that to say everything was always the same and therefore it is not a great cause for worry. It is a great cause for worry. But what is happening now is not, is not something that has happened out of nowhere. It's something that has structural roots in what has been happening over the years in you know, 2016, in 2014, in 2013, in 2010, in 20, 2008, and before that, and in the 90s, and before that. So this is part of a long running story in which the chapters change. Of course, what is happening now is grievously troubling because you know, whether we like it or not, if, if the chain of logical thought leads us to a particular point, and that point is one that means something horrible, we still have to acknowledge that that may be the case. If you look at what, is, what has happened in Kashmir since the August, uh, the, the August of the 5th, then and, and look at the continued way, the blasé way in which the silencing and the suffocation of the people has, has continued, and you know, initially people wondered whether this would, whether this this uh, the silencing would out outlast the Independence Day. Surely they could not. E actually, let me step back a bit. Even before the fifth of August, when the troops were being sent in, and all of us were thinking, we were all hearing this that something's going to happen. People did not think that it would happen like this overnight, with you know tens of thousands of more troops and overnight the constitution being changed and people being completely blanked out. It. Yet it did. Move forward, people thought, not surely not past Independence Day. Surely they couldn't do that on Eid. They couldn't keep that going for 62 days, but it has been going on. Uh, is there a plan? Not so far as anyone can discern. There is, uh, there is no, there is no, if you think about it from the point of view of those who have brought this about, it, and they have, for those of you who might not know, they have imprisoned, the, they have basically rendered the entire spectrum of Kashmiri leadership of all political shades completely irrelevant, detained them, put them under house arrest, and, uh, you know, and carried out these egregious human rights violations, including on minors, uh, on small children, which is, which is, again, by the way, nothing new. But, but the fact that all voices, including the most pro-India voices, including their own collaborators, have been silenced. All of those people have been have been silenced and the entire population is, is under that siege. Winter lies ahead. Surely, they, if you think about what is, what, where these things lead, and in the current global, uh, global climate of a, a huge amount of indifference and apathy, notwithstanding the, the media reports, in practice, what, you know, what has, what difference has that made? So I, I, I do not wish to be a, you know, I, I mean, I, I just want to say that this, what is happening in Kashmir is a grave cause for worry. Because if you follow that thought to its logical conclusion, it does not lead to a place that anyone wants to think about. And yet, the reason for the urgency of what, why we have to keep talking about it is because um, truly more horrible things than happen than we may even imagine, be able to imagine. 
So uh, and and this has the longer history also in that as all of these all of my fellow panelists have pointed out um, that there is a that Kashmir is an unfinished project of right wing Hindu nationalism. This the 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 obsession with Kashmir is not something that the RSS recently realized after Modi came to power. This goes way back. This goes back to the late forties. It goes back to some of their most important figures, you know, uh, Shyama Prasad Mukherjee and others. It goes back to that whole history. It, this, what was they, there were interludes, but what is happening now is part of that longer story. And for those people who came in here, and you know, and also for the government rationale, the idea that the regressive left is, uh, you know, is not concerned about uh, rights for homosexuals or gay rights or minority rights or disability rights or any rights. This this is also the rationale used by the government in India to say that. Well, we're doing this in order to make them more progressive. It's a, it's a typical colonial rationale that offers a choice between development and freedom and uses the rights of one oppressed groups against another. And that's what, what is happening. I will not deny that, that uh, you know, that uh, both India and Kashmir are, are essentially have, have issues of prejudice, of heteronormativity, of all kinds of, you know, of, of these things. But but the, the answer to that is not a homo-nationalist oppression of a whole range of people, and uh, which is what, what, is being, what is being carried out. In 2001, um, Arundhati Roy was write in, in, uh, writing about Syria, had that statement that what we see right now are civilians starving as they're waiting to be killed. And when I think about Kashmir, uh, you know, the, the silence people in Kashmir, it, it, it deeply does worry me. Uh, and especially so since since so much of this, including the, the, the people who, who, um, who came in earlier and they tweeted about gay rights in, uh, for JNK and, and I wonder why not Ladakh, um, but you know, there's, there's that question, um, surely, because if you're going with the Indian story, you should also include Ladakh, but anyway, so, and then that tweet has been retweeted, I checked on Twitter, by, um, by somebody with a surname which is Kashmiri Pandit. So, uh, so there's, there's this, in, you know, there are these interesting alliances. On the other hand, this also indicates the desperation of, of these despots, these global despots. Um, with, you know, in the case of Kashmir, uh, Divish, because I'm really bad with understanding time, how, uh, how much time do I have? Seven minutes. Okay, so I'm, I'm good. Because of, of my issues. Yeah, okay, right. So I, so I can say some of the things. So Kashmiris are now, the, the, uh, following on from the revocation, Kashmiris are being claimed in the name of democracy, colonized, as they have been, but this is a new phase on this. Um, and um, the fact that these people needed to intervene here, and if we were in India, it would not just be an intervention by masked people. It would be an intervention with people who have something that they can physically hurt you with and probably would. There was, I remember the, the Delhi University lecturer who, was, who had his ribs broken. So, uh, so you know, this is, this is that version of, of the disruption. Now, but it indicates the, the, the fear that they have of speech, of talk around Kashmir. You, you bring to me the, the, you know, the, the most kind of avid ideologue who believes that actually this is all happening for these reasons and if you talk to them, you may be able to actually shatter through the fact that, the, shatter through what they believe in by pointing to obvious things and this is why the, the, this is why the, um, the wars in India over, over speech are fought in TV studios. In the aftermath of Pulwama, we saw that, uh, the February attacks. There were these journalists dressed in combat fatigues in TV studios, literally wanting, you know, wanting a more uh, muscular, warlike stance. Um, because what the purpose there is to marshal all different kinds of people to the Hindutva cause and to use Kashmir as as central to that uh, to that framing. It is also to eliminate eliminate any gray zones, to eliminate the fact that there are. It isn't about purism that there are gray zones that people have, that people even in Kashmir have different viewpoints on this and in the different regions of Kashmir. And none of that, that of course, will be affected until we actually have uh, more, uh, uh, more conversations across those people and not just about India and Pakistan. And this is where people outside of that region have a role. Um, the, the Hindutva project in India also combines resentments very profitably, as they have done in Azam, Assam. They use people's pre-existing resentments, combine them, and then bring in their project as a way of saying, look, we're, we're doing this in order to, uh, you know, in order to um, fight for the rights of this or that minority, uh, as with any other he hegemonic nationalist discourse. It is a global, uh, it is a global problem. 
and it is a global problem of uh, my my definition that I always repeat is that we are faced with a global league of ruling electorally legitimated misogynist authoritarians who claim a monopoly on nationalism and uh, come to power challenging, trying to challenge, say that they're going to challenge neoliberalism, but at the same time profit from it through their crony capitalist backers. It's the same script in every country. Um, I wonder if I've just repeated that far too many times, but I just feel like that's it. That's the formula. That's what they're doing literally everywhere. And this is why, and they derive transnational uh, nourishment from each other's projects in terms of strategies, in terms of support, in terms of creating spectacles like the most recent Howdy Modi one. Uh, it, it helps Modi because people there, people, his supporters back home see, look how proud we are. Our leader is being feted by the pre uh, president of the US. It helps Trump because, well, he has a re-election coming up amongst other things. Um, so this is a global project and what is common to them is the hagiography of these leaders, their use of technology in very pernicious ways, including in, in the way in which elections uh, everywhere are, are, um, have become ever more algorithmic. Uh, the, the use of a moral vocabulary of good versus evil, almost a political theology type of thing, a preceded and, and accompanied by underfunding of education and the attacks on critical thinking, uh, again everywhere. Uh, and the way in which they bring disparate groups of people together. They, any hegemonic project cannot succeed unless it is able to combine disparate groups who may not already be seeing themselves as having something in common and they bring them together. And Hindutva in, 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 in India is successfully doing that. Um, another interesting to no thing to note is that, in, for, for example, with the Hindutva project, they are seeking legitimation through law, not in contravention of it. And this isn't, so they, the, you know, the revocation, it's, it's the fact that they will do, in order to transform the constitutional bodies and processes from within, they want to seek that. They did that constitutionally at one stroke, both doing what they did to Kashmir, but also showing the fragility of constitutional provisions. Mm -hmm. So they're doing that through, uh, you know, through constitutional, uh, through legal means, not in contravention of them. And the, the aftermath of that is then the regulation of perception. And that is where we also can intervene in, in challenging the means through which that perception is regulated. Uh, when we talk about solidarity, and since this is one of our themes today, uh, I, I, I believe that I think, I'm always telling my students, don't say I believe, that's an assumption. But, but um, no, but I would want to argue that it is, um, that our solidarities really should not be based on the fact that they are people like us because they share our religion or because they are ultimately our people. And how can we do this to Indians who, or people who we want to claim as part of Indians? I think those bases of solidarity might have very limited, uh, limited um, usefulness for the people themselves in whose name these, these solidarity stances are happening. Because Kashmiris may not be people like you. It's the same thing as in all refugees have to be amazing and excellent before you care for the fact that there are, they are refugees. Because if one person out of any one of them, then see, we thought they were good people, but they're not. Well, it isn't because they are good people. It is because they are people. It is because they are people who have rights, who may not be <laughs> So I'm saying this is not about whether Kashmiris are good people, whether Kashmiris are part of our cause, whether Kashmiris are our people. That should not be the reason we care. We should care because they are a people who are being suffocated and, and placed under siege and who have rights and who have a, 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 a legal, political, historical issue that is not being settled. Um, the, the backdrop to, to this, um, and when I talked about the elimination of grey zones, in 2017, the, the still uh, head of Indian Armed Forces who was appointed um, uh, um, in, in super session, um, said, made a statement in the aftermath of the human shield uh, incident where a Kashmiri civilian was used as a human shield um, and, and then awarded for it, that major was awarded for it. Uh, he said, so the Indian Army chief said, uh, I wish the Kashmiris would use guns instead of stones because then it would be easier for us to retaliate. This person is still in charge. So it, can, it, it shows you the, the, the logic of a state and then there is a separate question of whether you can expect the state to be a moral actor or not. But even if not, then that just makes our job more urgent. Um, to, to want to provoke greater violence so that the repression can be final and complete. And this takes me back to that earlier point that I was saying that, you know, even if our thoughts lead us to a place we don't want to go, if, if that's where we're headed, then that is cause for concern. So, um, so I, um, and um, 
Okay, so and and this permanent state of of exception is is happening is is the, the something that continues. Uh, the reason we also keep talking about the coloniality of Indian exercise of power in Kashmir is if you look back at something like Jallianwala Bagh uh, massacre, right? The Jallianwala Bagh massacre. That when Indians talk about it, they say, well, you know, General Dyer killed all these people, and um, but preceding that massacre, just the days before, there had been this. If you read the the story. people uh, so in in lanes in amritsar there were barriers put up and everybody going through that lane had to crawl under so it was preceded by this abjection this enforced abjection of the people so that they would recognize um, that that they did not that they could not be fully fully human and this and this is something that we also see in kashmir in the way in which that colonial abjection happens elections are an abjection because they force people to say well if you want administration you have to come out and vote it's it's like the the worst choice but if you vote we're going to say it's a festival of democracy if you don't vote we're going to say well see you are just basically people who don't understand democracy and then tie it up with a wider islamophobic thing so there is a a um, a coloniality of the way in which power is exercised here and um and which is which is preceded by and the consent for that see i do want to believe that not every indian not every american not e even every modi or trump supporter gets up in the morning thinking how do i make the world a worse place how do i how do i make sure that more people die or suffer i think it is really important for counter hegemonic process uh, projects to understand what is it that motivates these people and what because without that you one can have the 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 you know the strongest arsenal of reason and logic and it would not it would not make it through the point is you have to understand what what is it that motivates those people and in and you know and there's that indoctrination if you think about the rss and it is an absolute shame that more people in the world do not know about the rss uh, including here i just feel like you have to know how can you not know this is you know this is not unlike just because it's happening there it doesn't mean that it's not important so um so the the indoctrination with these camps begins young but part of the way in which this legitimation this consent for violence is being generated is they are these people are all um the these people are um the way in which that consent for uh, is that india equals modi modi equals national pride before that indians humiliated everywhere target of racism discriminated in in ostensibly multicultural societies and modi is the the person who is bringing pride to indians and getting india that place in the sun so if you if you counter that against you know the and 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 there is some some you know some some reason why those because it's always harder to seek validation you know to not to find the internal basis for self realization it's easier to seek validation externally and in this case the validation that is being provided to these people that criticism of modi is criticism of india is criticism of all indians and that needs that equation of modi equals india which is very powerfully and successfully has been made by these people needs to be challenged that uh, and and that is a part of that story and i'm not saying i'm not saying that there is aren't all kinds of other problems i'm just saying that in terms of strategy one can't one yeah i i think that there, there is that step and i think that pride and modi thing needs to be challenged uh very uh centrally um is there anything else that i'm absolutely dying to say um we'll have question answer time actually i will yes it's um i just want to conclude by saying you know this is war is of perception <coughs> interpretation international media we are you know now this time there is a lot more attention but then that could also be that what is maybe the world also sees that where it's headed is a very bad place within india it is important to challenge the uh, you know the fact that modi is actually being celebrated worldwide and the gates foundation type award does not help especially if it comes two days after uh, especially two days after that people are are shot dead for defecating in the open so this 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 understanding of projects of cleanliness and purity and where they lead and how they are fascist needs to be made more strongly but also more and more people need to uh talk about how it is placing the rights of one groups of group of people against another like you know making this argument in terms of kashmiri pandits i mean for example okay this is where i should end because everyone always asks what about kashmiri pandits so in case someone does let me just uh, preempt that uh, if you care about kashmiri pandits please ask the courts to open the the cases ask the courts to open the cases from the late 1980s 
uh, acknowledge the fact that there was an exodus, a minority was targeted, look at the perpetrators, declassify the archives, find out what happened, create knowledge around that and punish the perpetrators and alongside that admit the failures of the state, apologize for all of the other uh, you know killings and forced disappearances, mass rapes and everything else and then let's let's say you care for Kashmiris. If you actually care for Kashmiris, it silences the Muslim uh, Kashmiri Muslims and enables their continued torture and uh, then that is not care for Kashmiri pundits that's refusal to see the fact that Kashmiris of all kinds of uh, are being targeted so uh, so I feel like th that is just a totally not an argument that is uh, being made but people like us would you know we, we just need to be heard more by the people who believe in these things as well <laughs> Uh, I mean, we have uh, 